Hi, and welcome to this tutorial on carbon allotropes. In the previous tutorial, we had a look at metallic bonding in metal atoms, and we defined those as the um, attraction between the delocalized electrons and the positive ions in the lattice. And now we understand the physical properties behind metals. So here we're having a look at carbon allotropes. So what are allotropes? And the examples, so diamond, graphite, and other allotropes of carbon. Now you may well have covered this at GCSE, but like I said before, it's important we've got a really strong foundational understanding and we can still add knowledge on top of what you already know. So what is an allotrope? It's a different molecular or crystalline form of the same element resulting in different physical properties. And carbon is super exciting and interesting because it's got these different allotropes and we use them for so many different things. So the carbon atoms gain a full outer shell through the formation of four covalent bonds. And this forms two molecular structures mainly. We've either got graphite or diamond and they have vastly different chemical properties and physical properties. So here we've got an example of diamond as a giant covalent structure. So a couple of tutorials ago, we talked about giant covalent structures um, and it presents the covalent bonds between the carbon atoms. So all of these lines are the covalent bonds and they go on and on and on into the distance. So remember, this isn't a molecule. This is going to go on and on and on. I just picked somewhere to stop the image. Always remember that. OK, so there's more and more atoms here going on and on into the distance with any sort of giant lattice, whether it's ionic or, or covalent. So each carbon atom we can see forms four bonds. So if I pick this one here, one, two, three, four, if I'm picking this atom here, um, and they're all four are covalent bonds. So diamond is very, very hard in terms of its physical properties, um, and it's very difficult to break because it's got four covalent bonds, all of the possible covalent bonds are formed, and they're very strong. It's got very high melting and boiling points, which is why we use it in a lot of industry. Um, and a large amount of energy is obviously needed to break these covalent bonds. That's why it has such high melting and boiling points. It's a good thermal conductor. So the strong covalent bonds mean that thermal energy is quickly transferred through the diamond. And it's a really poor electrical conductor because the electrons are fixed in the covalent bonds. So if I show the electrons here, they are fixed in place. They are not in a sea of delocalized electrons. They can't go anywhere. And um, so they cannot carry a charge. And of course, diamond is insoluble. The covalent bonds are so strong that any attraction with the solvent, it's not interested in it. It's not going to form it. And um, so it's insoluble in water and organic solvents. But then let's have a look at graphite. So graphite is a little bit different. If I have a molecule of graphite here, uh, sorry, if I take a carbon here, you can form it's got, you can see it's got three, not four, but three covalent bonds instead with three other atoms. And that leaves it with one outer electron that's not involved in the covalent bonding. And this is where you're going to find uh, the outermost electrons. Um, it's delocalized. So the fourth electron for each atom is delocalized and it's free to move around. Um, and so what we end up with is this layer structure. So carbon atoms are arranged in hexagonal sheets. So what I mean by hexagonal is it's a hexagon, one, two, three, four, five, six hexagonal sheets uh, in layers. And the layers are joined by weak intermolecular forces called London forces. And on the old specification, we used to call them van der Waals. Check your specification. On OCR, we now call them London. Um, it might be different between different specifications. Um, but those are weak intermolecular forces. So graphite is soft, it's slippery because those layers are able to slip over one another and they can slide because these forces here are weak, whereas the forces here are stronger, okay? So it can be used uh, um, in pencils and it's still got a high melting and boiling point because the covalent bonds within its hexagonal structure are very strong, so a large amount of energy is needed to break them. It's a good electrical conductor. So I said a couple of tutorials ago that most, this isn't a giant covalent structure actually, um, but this is an example where we've got lots of covalent bonds, but we still are, have good electrical conductivity, which is um, a relatively rare example because we've got the fourth electron of a carbon is not involved in a covalent bond. It's delocalized. It's free to move and carry a charge. Graphite is insoluble. Hopefully you know that just from life in general. Um, you know, we can use it in pencils. It does not dissolve in water. Um, because these covalent, these strong covalent bonds here, they're stronger than any attraction that could form within this between the solvent molecules and the carbon atoms. Um, so it's insoluble in both water and organic solvent. And it's got a low density. OK, so due to the large distance between the layers um, and the weak intermolecular forces, they can't hold the layers very close together. So there's loads of space here. So it's not dense. It's got a low density. 
So an exam question might ask you, how do the properties of graphite and diamond differ? And how does it make them suitable for their uses? So for example, graphite can be used as an electrical conductor and as a lubricant, whereas diamond is used for cutting machines. So the head of the cutting machine, because it can cut through rock um, because of its structure. Carbon atoms can also be arranged in non-macromolecular structures. And so the main types you need to know about are graphene and Buckminster fullerene as well. And there's lots of research going into how we can use nanotubes and all sorts. It's a really exciting area of chemical engineering. So graphene is a single layer of graphite. It's an extremely strong and light material. So it's the image I showed you before, but without the layers. So it's just one layer. And a Buckminster fullerene is a carbon nanoparticle. So that's exciting. We could put something inside and transport something somewhere in the human body, etc. So there's lots and lots of interesting um, implications of this. So it's tiny hollow spheres of covalently bonded carbon atoms in a, in a sphere. So each carbon, as with our graphite layers, is bonded to just three other carbons. So the covalently bonded carbon atoms form rings in the shape of hexagons and pentagons. OK, so hexagons and pentagons. So here's a pentagon and here's a hexagon. They can be used to deliver drugs to different parts of the body. And we've got a relatively low sublimation point. So it directly turns into a gas from its solid state without becoming a liquid first. And iodine does that as well. It goes from liquid, uh, it goes from solid straight to gas, sublimes. So this is the same, it sublimes. Due to the really weak um, London forces, or sometimes called Van der Waals forces, between individual Buckminster fullerene molecules, that is what leads to that sublimation happening. That's why it doesn't exist in the liquid state. Um, it's very soft, so little energy is needed to overcome the forces. It's um, an electrical conductor because it's got the delocalized electron. It's got one electron in each carbon atom that is not involved in a, in a covalent bond. And the extent of the delocalization is less than in graphene, graphene um, or graphite. So the electrical conductivity is worse in comparison.